Hey everyone, Tom Smith from Grimdark Magazine here with Steven Erickson today. Steve, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing Thanks well. so much for agreeing to sit down with us. Oh, it's my pleasure. So luckily we're in the same time zone, so one of us isn't talking in the middle of the night. That is good. That is good. <laughs> so I have uh, some prepared questions, but we can just go wherever you, you want to go on this. Sure. Okay. So since the last time uh, we interacted a few years ago for your interview, uh, the world's kind of taken a turn with the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. And mm -hmm. without making this political at all, just mentioning how the world's changing, um, how has it affected your routine at all, if any? Well, it's completely uh, destroyed my routine, uh, as I'm sure it's done for many people. Um, I tend to write in um, cafes, and once the cafes basically shut down, um, it really uh, threw a spanner uh, in the works in terms of my writing process. Um, I think I generally need to be surrounded by humanity. Uh, I need people all around me when I'm writing. And so this has been um, rather difficult. Um, I've tried a few times when it was warm enough here in Victoria, uh, sitting outside at um, pubs or cafes. And that's, that's not too bad, but... Um, at the same time, it's 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 not quite the same as, as being able to do as I normally do, which is actually uh, sit in cafes or even a food court uh, in a nearby mall, um, which actually is great for me for writing. Uh, there's people all around, um, everybody's busy, um, and I prefer that. Okay. So yeah, it's been difficult. I can imagine. So would you say you're kind of extroverted then? Well, I mean, writing is the most introverted activity possible. It's also the most isolating activity. Um, and I guess I like, you know, even though I'm sitting in a cafe, I, I, in a sense, I end up isolating myself anyways. I'm not, you know, in conversations. I'm, I'm dwelling in another world entirely. Um, so in that respect, I guess it's very introverted. Um, but at the same time, I think I need the visual stimulus uh, on all sides, just, just sort of uh, to look up, shift focus, um, I guess in many ways, I need to remind myself of humanity because I think what a lot of writing, uh, and I know I used to be a, a writer at night. Um, so from like 11 PM on to like three in the morning. And I would do that writing at home. And um, sometimes you forget the reasons why you're writing. And, you know, it's the people out there that, um, I'm not imagining that the people in the cafe are my audience, but they're at least representative of an audience of some form. And I think I need that. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, it seems like uh, most of the writing community is pretty introverted in nature. Mm -hmm. but I, it always uh, strikes me as unusual when somebody is likes to be out in public and likes to go, you know, do things um, where there's a lot of people. I suppose it is. Uh, I think... I've become more extroverted as time's gone, gone past, as I've gotten older. Um, I may be more fearless in that respect. Uh, and it's probably one of the reasons why I'm showing up more now on podcasts and, and interviews and um, Zoom calls, uh, recorded ones with, with reviewers of my books on, on YouTube and things like that. Um, I've always loved sitting on panels. I've loved being um, at conventions and conferences uh, where I can talk writing. Um, it's one of my, my great passions. And so I guess I've become much more extroverted, but I think you're right. I think a lot of what produces writers, um, is not nearly as genetic as one thinks. I think it's, there may be a proclivity for introspection. Um, but I think a lot of, a lot of it, the foundations of, of, of an artist, uh, come in their childhood. And I don't know many artists um, who have a functional childhood. They've had dysfunctional childhoods. Um, and I don't know if that's, that plays a role in this thing, but I know, you know, when I was much younger and we were living in, in a state of abject poverty and, and for me, plunging into a book was my salvation. And um, so as a writer, you, I guess maybe that's an extension of that. You, you plunge into the book you're making um, and that's a salvation of a form, um, which, you know, helps, helps one stay sane in, in this world these days, at least for me. Right. So that actually brings me to a, 
something I was going to ask you. Um, yes. So COVID era restrictions aside, um, what is your opinion on modern conventions, uh, both serious ones for the industry insiders and fan based cons? Uh, what was the second one? Uh, fan based. Fan based. Yeah. Fan based. Um, I generally I enjoy conventions. Um, I don't go to as many as I used to, and obviously, um, with COVID, uh, we've had to cancel. I think I canceled two for sure, possibly a third one, um, because well, one was in Spain, one was in Winnipeg, and one was in uh, France. Um, and I do have uh, a lot of fun because generally I, I'm meeting authors that I've not met before. And that's, that's always great. And um, some of the conventions are kind of academic or scientifically inclined, which I really like. Um, other ones are fan-based and that's fine too. I mean, you, you, you sit and sign books um, for hours, hours on end in the day. And that's cool. Cause then, then you get to interact with, with the people who are reading your books and buying books. Um, one thing I've, I basically am now I've sworn off is Comic Cons. Um, I've done a, a sh quite a number. I think I would do Emerald City again because that was a lot of fun. It has a good um, live or bookstore kind of section. Um, but generally speaking, um, as writers and novels, uh, we're kind of the lowest of the low on, on the guest list in, in Comic Cons. Um, and we do feel kind of pushed off to the side, at least I do, um, as as fiction writers. And, and I just, I find myself, um, this, is, this could be controversial, but I remember being at a, con, a comic con in, in Portugal and I was doing some signings and it was a long table off to my left with comic book artists. Um, and I mean, they work their butts off because they do a drawing for everybody. And um, so the lineups, you know, back up, way up, but they're all men. It wasn't a single woman sitting behind that, you know, behind that table. And I just thought, man, this is not a fantasy science fiction convention. This is a comic con. And I felt kind of uneasy about it. I felt um, something was wrong here. Um, so yeah, I, I probably will be turning down comic cons, I think from now on. Yeah. I mean, there's Unless a I see some kind of wholesale change in, in the way, you know, the way it's approached, but the industry, that industry seems very, very male dominated, um, which, which is a bit odd. Yeah. There's a fair amount of gatekeeping going on there. I think, you know, that could be. Yeah. Yeah. And I won't comment on that. Cause I don't know in terms of the organizers and quite often the organizers I'm working with are women actually. So, um, it's more, I guess, guest lists and maybe there's just not enough, um, in the industry, um, of women artists and women writers, uh, yeah, which could be, you know, something that I think could be addressed at some point or another. Um, I know I've got uh, an artist who is just uh, on spec doing a comic book adaptation of one of my Boca Lane Cobra Brooch novellas. And I just said, go for it. And, you know, when she's done, um, we'll, we'll, we'll get it out there. Um, so, I mean, it, it's not it's not kind of a professional deal, but at least it's getting a, a female artist who is doing an adaptation of a novella uh, all on her own. And uh, I really, really hope it works out. You know, what's really interesting is uh, comic books for years have kind of been at the forefront of uh, these social issues, basic equality. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, uh, even today, still don't realize what they're reading. And when somebody comes out and says, hey, this social issue X is we need to address this. They're like, why do you have to make this political? And it's like, comic books have been political since day one. I mean, always, always. My goodness, I, I grew up reading comics because, mm -hmm. you know, I couldn't afford books. But I remember I could afford comics for my allowance. And um, ah, immensely political. Um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite comic books was, well, two, two of them, uh, Weird War and um, Haunted Tank, which were two World War II um, themed comic books, both anti-war, I mean, profoundly anti-war. And that was just part of the part for the course. Um, and then of course you look at a lot of the superheroes like Superman or, or Captain America. I mean, it, it's, 
that it's very ideologically based. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why this is a problem. I mean, it's always been there, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's become a, um, I don't know, a, a reason for reaction um, that's really quite misplaced in many respects. Yeah. So let's talk, uh, you know, Book of the Fallen for a minute. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a really rich and diverse setting there with lots of storylines going at the same time, lots of different types of characters, well-developed characters, even though there's like a hundred of them going at a time. <laughs> um, so you currently have a, a series in the works that's going to be for, focusing on Karsa Orlam, correct? Mm -hmm. um, he's probably one of the more popular characters in the setting and a pretty complex guy, I think. Um, yeah, quite divisive, I think, in terms of audience response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for good reason. I mean, he's a very ambivalent character. Mm -hmm. So uh, as big as this setting is, uh, this intense world building that you and uh, Ian Esselman have, have done, um, how long do you see yourself writing in it? And do you see an end game, or are you just going to play it all by ear? Um, well, I'm, I'm under contract to do this, the Carsa trilogy. Uh, and then I have to finish the third book of the Carcanus trilogy. So I know I'm committed for, um, well, I'm, I'm awaiting the return of the first book on the, the Carsa trilogy from my editor, which should come this week. Um, so I'm on, uh, I'm on contract for three more um, novels set in the Malazan uh, universe. And, and I think I'm on, I'm, I'm on contract for at least, well, three more novellas, uh, Bokalin Cobra Brooch novellas, also set in that universe. Beyond that, um, I do have a science fiction novel planned um, and possibly a sequel to Rejoice, uh, A Knife to the Heart. Uh, so I, I, to me, you know, um, I don't know how long I'm going to be on this earth anyway. So, you know, I'll, I'll clear this, I'll clear that slate and then I'll worry about it when I get there. Okay. In fair terms enough. Of writing more stuff. <laughs> but I think, I think the Malazan universe, um, in many respects, the, the 10 volume series, um, pretty much explored everything I wanted to explore. I mean, there, there are aspects right now that is kind of a, the trilogy I'm working on now with Carsa is kind of the aftermath and, and some of the legacy of things that we saw in the 10 book series. Mm -hmm. um, but I think once I've sort of uh, explored those areas, I, I'd be probably pretty hard pressed to come up with another story set in the Malazan story, or Malazan universe. So um, I think probably most of your fans by now know that uh, you guys came up with a setting uh, from your gaming campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, you and Ian, and I'm assuming probably several other people. <laughs> well, initially just me, uh, and Ian Cameron S. Lamont, so I know him as Cam. So I'll mm -hmm. say Cam and you'll know okay. that that's Ian. But yeah, me and Cam were, were uh, we were gaming literally one-on-one -on -one for years. Wow. Uh, setting out this universe. Um, we shared flats uh, when we were both at University of Victoria. Um, mm -hmm and we were on digs and so you know it just it just uh more often than not uh at least the foundational aspects of it it was just cam and myself right so my question uh, building off of that is um are any of your popular characters in the books characters that you gamed with um gamed with you mean characters i played correct yeah oh yeah lots same for cam yeah so who is your um, favorite? Well, it's a good point. Um, I enjoyed playing Krupp because I could I could mess around with diction, um, <laughs> and you know got into the quick habit of, of addressing myself in the third person, which um, which was a lot of fun. Um, and Amanda Rake was the very first character I rolled up, and that was in AD and D Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, and then we switched to GURPS um, somewhat later. But he was running with uh, other characters I had, which included Kaladin Brood and uh, Triss, the Queen of Dreams. Mm -hmm. So those are the three characters I was playing uh, when Cam was running the campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then we got into the Malaysia Marine stuff. And so um, I'm trying to remember, uh, I was playing Fiddler, uh, Quick Ben and Kalam, I think. Um, so Cam was running that campaign. So NPCs included, I think Whiskey Jack, um, Mallet, uh, Trots, um, Hedge. Wow. He wasn't Hedge in the game. He was Prairie Dog. But um, <laughs> when I when I first uh, sold Gardens of the Moon, it was in the UK, and they didn't know what Prairie Dogs were. So um, I swapped it over to Hedgehog, and then just shortened it to Hedge. Awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, and then we did a lot in Darujistan. So I was playing uh, Krop and Ralik Nam, the assassin. Um, and so Cam's NPCs included Baruch and, and various other characters. Crocus didn't exist in the games. Um, and he's entirely fictitious. Uh, and, oh, who else did I play? And that's probably the, the major ones. Um, Candid, Dastin, people like that. And, and then early on, well, later on, actually, we did uh, Kel and Bed and Dancer, and I was running those ones. So he played uh, the emperor, or who would become the emperor, and uh, I did Dancer as an NPC. So. That's a very entertaining pairing. I think uh, those two and Bug and, uh, do you say Tehol? Tehol, Tehol, oh. yeah. Okay. Uh, those yeah, those are, those are entirely novelistic. They're, they didn't come from games. Um, Bug into whole, uh, very much tied into that storyline. Um, but I think, uh, you know, people have commented that on this a lot, that there's a lot of pairing up of characters in the Malazan books. And I guess Cam and I both got comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, to run with two characters and have one, you know, play off the other. Yeah. Um, and so I guess that's, that's sort of one of the uh, hallmarks of the series, is, is yeah. get those. It, it took me by surprise yeah. reading that that first part with uh, Bug and Tahol because I wasn't expecting anything funny. Uh, yeah, it I, was uh, it was strange. Yeah, um, <laughs> you know, Midnight Tides, the fifth book where he where you first meet him. Um, it's a story about two sets of three brothers, and one on one side of of uh, the cultural divide, and one on, one set on the other. Um, and so I think by that point I'd already introduced. The other two um, brothers, uh, and then I had to come up with Tehol, and I didn't know what to do with Tehol, so I, I put him on a rooftop, and then uh, I wrapped a blanket around his his hips, and the story just his story sort of came from there, mm -hmm. and uh, he had his manservant, and um, it just it built from there. I think even initially I didn't understand fully who the manservant was going to be, mm -hmm. but. Um, that's kind of all fell into place. Yeah. Uh, Midnight Tides as a novel, it, it felt like it wrote itself. It was one of the most effortless um, novels I've ever written. Yeah. It just all just uh, came out pretty much as a clean draft. Um, wow. It's very unusual. Yeah. I, I, I remember uh, the first time reading through, I was crying on parts of it. <laughs> it, it was that funny to me. And I, like I said, it was surprising because I was not expecting anything humorous by that point in the books. Right. Very yeah. serious tone. And, you know, and then having, um, you know, having the manservant turn out to be an elder god was kind of a... Mm -hmm. yeah. Spoilers. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, well done on that. That was... Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, I, that was one of my more enjoyable parts, I think. Uh, cool. Cool. Totally caught me by surprise. So... Let's change gears here. We talked about Book of the Fallen enough. Um, and I think my, my room's going very dark. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hang on one second. Okay. Well, now you've, better, you, you've done a much better display of your whiskey collection, so. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, something that near and dear to your heart, and I actually enjoy it too. I, I almost went that route career-wise myself is uh, the archaeology and anthropology. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, how, how much influence would you say that that career had on your writing? Uh, well, it had profound influence for both myself and, and Cam, because 
we met on a dig. Um, so without the archaeology, um, that it, it's it's quite likely the Malazan universe never would have uh, seen the light of day. Um, because when I met Cam, he had already had experience um, at university with the gaming club. So he knew about uh, role-playing games. I knew nothing about them. Um, and it was a small crew. I think there was one, two, three, four, five people on crew. So um, Cam and I were paired up sharing a tent and uh, cause another two were a couple. Um, so we just, yeah. And then we realized that we both liked fantasy and science fiction. Um, and uh, that's sort of where everything began um, on, on a dig in, in Northwest Ontario. So without without archaeology on that sense, in that sense, uh, yeah, there would not have been a Malaysia series, um, because that friendship would never, would never have happened. I think I may have played hockey against him at one point or another, but that was about it. Um, so, uh, yeah, there is that aspect, and then of course, we took our anthropological uh, schooling and applied it to a fantasy setting. Um, seeking as much verisimilitude as we could in terms of the cultures and the history that we were going to tell. Um, so that plays, that plays a huge role in the world building um, and that sense of, of deep time because, I mean, I think we did one campaign. Here's one element that people probably don't know about. Um, there's, we finished a campaign where Kellenved and Dancer having uh, just ascended, um, kind of step out of the picture in, in terms of the storyline of the Malaysian world. But then we ran a campaign in which they were using the Azath houses to actually travel back in time. And so I took the Quantali uh, continent and pushed it back to the Bronze Age, which is, I mean, right now it's, it, or in terms of the novels, it's, it's Iron Age. And then I kind of sort of redrew the maps um, slightly to uh, take into account lower sea levels and that kind of thing. And so then we ran that whole, that whole campaign that probably will never see the light of day as novels, but was very, very useful in building the backstory to, to what was going on um, that showed up later on in, in the Malazan books. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we were playing around with, with uh, deep time all the way through uh, when we ran games, when we introduced characters and when we created cultures. Um, and of course, most of history is about cultures and conflict. And an anthropological take is a little bit different from a his, uh, historical take. Mm -hmm. um, and we wanted to really explore that kind of thing. And I, I think, you know, even in the gaming, as much as, as the gaming was a lot of fun and just, you know, building up laughs and, and you know, creating absurd scenarios and all the rest, um, we were pushing hard for that, that sense of deep time that was going to then show up and bubble to the surface in, in the Malazan books. So Excellent. yeah, very important. So um, since you brought up uh, Kellenved, um, was it Shadow Throne, his other name? Yeah. OK, so how much of his craziness is an act and how much of it is serious? I mean, is he really in your your? You know what? And I'm not the person to ask, because <laughs> I was the, I was the, the uh, the game master and so cam played kellen bit and he played him close to his chest i could i couldn't tell whether he was completely you know off his off his uh you know completely insane or um incredibly clever but i mean in terms of running the game he was also incredibly lucky on occasion so um and i think you know when, when cam is now writing out the the these books on the foundations of the empire he's having a lot of fun with that because Kelevet is, is a mysterious, mysterious character. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I like that. I like the way um, Cam has been portraying that mm -hmm. because I couldn't, I had no idea. I couldn't guess. Right. I like the frustration he brings out on the other characters. Yeah. Well, yeah. He brought it out <laughs> to me too. Yeah. Especially, you know, through NPCs and all the rest because a lot of the NPCs were people like Surly, who then becomes the Empress, um, Tatter, or, uh, uh, not Tara Sale. She was. She shows up in the book. Um, Surly, Tayshren, uh, Urko, Crust. You know all, all the the usual gang that surrounded um, Kelavet and Dancer. 
were all NPCs. And yeah, they were they were having to deal with the mess that, that Kelvin Ed was leaving behind constantly. And it was a lot of fun. It's fun games. Sounds like it. So another uh, archaeology uh, question for you. If you were uh, leading a dig and you could get full funding for any expedition, where would you like to go after? What would you pursue? Uh, I would probably... Mm. I, I, two, two immediate choices. Um, one is uh, probably somewhere in somewhere in Europe. I, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't know quite yet where because it's a, a number of, of choices. Um, but I'm very interested, obviously, in, in Neanderthal um, prehistory. So I would I would love to run a, a dig uh, a Neanderthal uh, site. Um, and that could be Croatia. I mean, it could be Gibraltar. It could be uh, Israel. It could be, you know, pretty much uh, a fairly wide range uh, or uh, range of uh, potential environments in which to do that. Um, I think the second option would be the island of Flores in Indonesia. Um, I'd like to run a project that explored a little bit more of um, the Hobbit, the, um, the diminutive um, homo or hominin um, that was found a few years back um, that really shook things up. And um, that's kind of fundamentally changed our thinking of, of human evolution. Uh, that must have been an amazing discovery. So you, you like the really ancient stuff. I'm, I'm right now I'm pushed. Yeah, I, I am. Uh, very interested in, in the the earlier stuff. Um, book I've just picked up, which I'm reading right now, Smart Neanderthal. Um, that one, actually, I'm well, about 40 pages in. I'm enjoying that a lot. The best Neanderthal book I recommend to everyone is this one. Okay. It is fantastic. This is my second copy because I've already loaned it out once. <laughs> But it's it's a brilliant, brilliant book. Um, yeah, I am very much interested in uh, paleoanthropology, um, going you know further back, uh, and I think I probably would have gone into that that subdiscipline um, had I the right teachers at my university when I was taking my degree. Um, but I didn't really have uh, I think the right instructors at the time, and so and also summer jobs. I mean, I was taking all the ones in, in Canada while, uh, while I was taking my degree. So that sort of led me into lithics and, and stone tools and, and rock art and that kind of stuff. So it seems like every so often when I'm reading uh, anthropological, archaeological stories, there's always somebody who has to question uh, carbon dating. You know, Radio and, carbon dating? Yes. How do you feel about the accuracy of that? Well, it's been recalibrated at least three times now, I think. Um, it's okay. It's right now, I mean, archaeology is in a kind of a golden age because um, there are so many other forms of uh, dating methods that you can then, you know, you, you, do, you don't go to a site these days and, and get simply radiocarbon dating. Um, you go to a site and you get... Uh, as many alternative means of dating as you can possibly, you know, assemble. Um, and some of them are pretty, um, pretty accurate. And that way, radiocarbon dating can easily be sort of compared and contrasted with, uh, say, potassium argon dating or... Um, and, then, and then nowadays, of course, we're also looking at uh, genetic analysis as well, which is, is still sort of in its infancy, but it, it's it's a good corroborative uh, method of, of determining um, species and division of species. Um, so it's, it's yeah, it, it has its own timeline that's a bit questionable because mm -hmm. it assumes um, a steady rate of mutation, which is, is unprovable. Right. Uh, there seems to be evidence that mutations actually occur rapid fire um, depending on the environmental conditions. Right. So, in that sense, it's hard to establish timelines, but there are many other uh, forms of dating now. Um, 
and stuff using uh, uh, paleobotany, that area, uh, plant materials and, and uh, teeth, teeth enamel, you know, all kinds of stuff. And so right. generally radiocarbon dating is the cheapest. And so it, you'll find it the most, but it has to be uh, carefully compared with other stuff. Right. There's probably uh, there's probably less destructive methods, right? Yeah. Because yeah. you're you have to destroy a piece to get that that information, right? Yeah, but nowadays, I mean, the amount of bone material you have to remove for radiocarbon dating is is minuscule compared to what it used to be. You know, it, it, they used to take big chunks out. Um, now you don't have to. Now it's just um, I don't know, just a few grams usually is enough. Nice. So, I, I mean, I don't do the lab side of stuff anyway, so I just, you know, if I'm on a site, I wrap it up the material in, in aluminum foil and send it off. <laughs> and yeah. I don't have to worry about it again. So, yeah, well, that's good. So you're, uh, you're up in Canada now. I had read a while mm -hmm. back you had moved to England or something. What happened there? Yeah, I've lived in England twice. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, what initially think, uh, uh, to find a publisher for Gardens of the Moon, among mm -hmm. other things. Um, I would, uh, I'd had, uh, let's see, Del Rey and Tor had both rejected Gardens of the Moon uh, when I sent it as uh, unsolicited manuscripts. Uh, back, back when you didn't have electronic versions, it was all printed out, photocopied. Right. Um, and so I felt that it kind of exhausted um, the uh, American, the major American publishers that uh, I had targeted. Mm -hmm. So, um, and because my wife's English, it, it was, it facilitated sort of heading back, heading to England, mm -hmm. uh, back for her, um, but first time for me, and then to try to get an agent and then a publisher in the UK. Mm -hmm. And then the second time our son graduated from here in Victoria from high school and promptly got into the University of Durham in England. So we moved back to Cornwall that time. But uh, you, you always wind up back home, huh? Uh, <laughs> we wind up back in Canada for, yeah. I mean, the, the move, the first move back to Canada was more based on what we were seeing in the British education system with our, with our son when he was like seven or eight. Uh, I, I didn't, I'm not a fan of the British education system. I think it specializes way too early. Mm -hmm. So that if somebody goes into the humanities uh, or into English, uh, um, any kind of subject like that, they become specialized very quickly, and they don't take um, they don't take classes or learn anything outside that specialty. Uh, so, and this is why you know you get a lot of you know sort of top top notch um, journalists in, in the UK who, when writing about say climate change clearly haven't got a, fl a flying clue what they're talking about because they have no science background at all. Yeah. And so um, here in Canada, the education system is, is very much geared towards a, a very holistic approach uh, to higher education. So that if you're taking, if you're in the faculty of arts, you still have to take science courses um, and vice versa. And I think that's a much better system. Yeah. Well, being American, I'm not going to comment on the state of our education system, <laughs> but uh, I'm hoping someday we'll we'll step up and meet the rest of the world halfway at least. Uh, there are some very good universities in, in the states, um, especially in archaeology. University of Pennsylvania is, is one of the top universities in the world. So um, when you get up to the sort of postgraduate stuff, uh, it's some pretty pretty damn good stuff out there. Yeah, it's, it's the generalized stuff I want to bring up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, when you, I'm going to shift back to the, the books here. When you uh, mentally construct a fight scene, um, mm -hmm. do you think of it uh, as more you're trying to express like the flavor of the fight or, or are you thinking like each individual move through and uh, I do both. I do both. Um, the flavor of the fight, you can, in that case, it's, it's, it's all about point of view and holding very tight to the point of view mm -hmm. and bearing in mind the fog of war so that, that the character is experiencing only what's immediately around that character. Everything else is just 
you know, it's just chaos out there. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also, I, I was a fencer for, from age 18 until about five years ago. Mm -hmm. So um, I make sure I, I choreograph, um, you know, if it's, if it's a duel or an exchange uh, or, uh, you know, a quick scrap type thing, uh, I will choreograph everything out and make sure that, that um, the moves are consistent and, you know, there's, there's no spinning in the air kind of stuff going on in, in the Lazen books because that is a death sentence. You'll see it on television and films. You'll see people spinning with their swords and it's just- Crouching tiger. Yeah, it's just, it's just a way to die. <laughs> you know, it's just because especially if the opponent's weapon is a, a pointed weapon, spear or uh, foil or rapier or, you know, anything with a point, you can get in and out in, in a uh, counter attack or, or thrust faster than anybody can spin. So it's, um, it's just not something to be done. I mean, it looks great on screen, but it's just, it's just not there. And so I, I try to be as, as, you know, um, realistic as I possibly can. And of course, a lot of the Malazan stuff, especially the Marines was kind of a mix between, um, crossbow equipped shock troops and, and, um, and the Roman legionnaire. So that's a short bladed weapon. And so it's all about, uh, the discipline. Um, it's not about reach and it's not about, you know, all these things that the barbarians brought against the Romans, which all failed. Um, right. it's actually about being very disciplined and infighting lots of infighting. And as a fencer, I learned in fighting fast because I don't have the reach of a lot of people I used to fence. You know, they're much longer reach, taller than me. And so if I can't get inside their guard, I'm toast. So I learned very quickly, you got to get inside their guard. And that's very similar to a short sword. Um, you want to get inside it. You want to get, you know, the, the Celtic broadsword, you know, hitting the top of your, your kite shield or your shield um, is the perfect opportunity to take a step forward and just gut the guy, you know? So um, that's kind of the approach I take on it. Okay. Yeah, so like the the bridge burners, I think, you know, a lot of fans really enjoy them. I, I kind of connected with them um, as a, I was a Navy medic, a corpsman. Oh, for, were you? For almost a decade, yeah. So like, while I was lucky enough to not have to go through anything like <laughs> depicted in the books, um, I did like the camaraderie of the group and, uh, you know, just the mm. military references. What did you draw yeah. on for that? Uh, I drew partly on archaeology digs. Um, it may sound strange, but there's a lot, of, and I've heard, I've talked it over with, with, with veterans and stuff, but there's a lot of parallels. Um, one thinks of, of an archaeology dig as involving, you know, amazing si uh, discoveries and, and, you know, breaking into tombs or whatever. It's not, it's, it can be uh, exceptionally tedious because you've got a, a trowel and you're digging through, you know, half a centimeter of soil at a time in a square pit. Um, extremely tedious. And then there's the isolation involved because you tend to be camped out in the bush. Uh, it's changed now. Most digs, they use motels and stuff. But back in my day, it was tents. And so, you know, we're out in the wilds. Um, and so you get to know your, your, your crew members very, very well over the course of a summer. And quite often towards the end, all their sort of civilized trappings are fallen away. <laughs> They're just all rubbish. And so um, you really get to know people. And um, so I made, I made a lot of use of that. And uh, I also worked on a couple of projects that were uh, horrendously run under really bad conditions. And there you just have to laugh it off and um, just go about and do your work. Um, but it, you know, there are times when it's profoundly demoralizing, you know, when, when something's being badly run yeah. or you find out at the end of a summer, you've been digging the wrong site, you know, this kind of stuff. I mean, it's, it happens. <laughs> um, and then other aspects of surveying and uh, other areas of archeology span where there are risks. Um, you know, I worked in Belize and in, in 83 and um, if we were surveying and we were near um, cane fields, well, a lot of the cane fields in, in northern Belize were just 
uh, 30 paces worth of cane. And then the center area would be um, marijuana growing. And those were regarded by people with shotguns. And so if you stepped out in the wrong time, you know, you had shotguns pointed at you. Um, and, and then later on, after the dig, I traveled all through Central America and, and found myself in, in a war zone in, in Guatemala. Um, so all of these things, I guess, all contribute in one fashion or another. Um, but I think digs more than anything else, in terms of that banter that exists, uh, that's very common on, on, on a good dig. Okay. Well, I think we're about to hit our time limit here in a second. I don't want to get cut. Right. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming on uh, with us today. And uh, no problem. If you're, you know, if you're ever talking with Cam and he's interested, I'd, I'd love to get him on too. I can pass on a request. Um, let's see if he's in a port because he's up in Alaska. Um, sometimes his uh, internet connection is not quite what it, what it could be. He also has three boys who then then to you know tend to use up a lot of the bandwidth at any one time. I have three sons as well. I get it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you get it. Then. Good. Are you, so are you based in San, San Diego? Um, I'm in the Bay Area, San Francisco area. Bay Area. Okay. Yeah. I work in Berkeley as an X-ray tech. Mm. I like Berkeley. Yeah, it's a great place. San Francisco, that's kind of cold. <laughs> you know that damp cold? It just yeah. sinks into the bones. Very. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, and uh I guess we'll just stop here and uh Okay. Hopefully uh you know we'll get a chance to do this again sometime in the future and anytime, anytime. Appreciate that, Steve. And thanks. Yeah, again. and you know it if there's a response from from your readers or viewers i guess now and they have lists of questions i'm happy to sort of reprise this you know in a couple of weeks time and, and answer some questions okay all right i, I definitely cool. know plenty of fans so all right all right <laughs> all right so thanks again for your time steve i yep. really appreciate that take care all right you too bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.